Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about mixed propulsion aircraft. This small category of aircraft is defined by having two different types of propulsion on the same aircraft. Whether it be propeller and jet, jet and rocket, rocket and propeller, etc, etc, this is often done in an effort to make up for some negative or underperforming aspect of one of the propulsion sources. For example, if a prop plane wanted much greater acceleration or rate of climb, they could add some rocket boosters that could be used on takeoff or just whenever necessary. In this instance, the rockets would be making up for the relative lack of power that the propellers had. Keeping this concept in mind, we turn our attention towards American aircraft carriers in the early to mid-40s, the late World War II era. At this stage, development of new carrier-based aircraft had hit a bit of a crossroads, the crossroads of propeller aircraft and jet aircraft. By this time, jet engine technology was seeing ever-increasing testing and serious consideration for use on military aircrafts. However, at the same time, the technology was at a comparatively rudimentary state. It was becoming more practical by the year, but it had shortcomings. Early jet engines had issues in that they weren't all that reliable yet and were prone to not being responsive. They also had pretty poor acceleration, but this was made up for with potentially higher speeds. While these issues could be relatively easily mitigated on your typical aircraft that took off from the land, these issues were significantly more problematic and dangerous for carrier-based aircraft. After all, because their runway would be inherently limited by the size of the carrier, being unresponsive or having poor acceleration could be a death sentence in several different ways. For the former issue, the problem would be on landing. If the pilot overshot the carrier and had to loop back around for another attempt, the jet not responding properly would mean that the plane couldn't reaccelerate and it would crash. On the latter issue, if the plane could not get up to speed on takeoff, then it would just dive off the front of the carrier and swan dive right into the ocean. The solution then for the military if they wanted a jet-powered carrier aircraft was to make mixed propulsion, propeller, and jet-powered aircraft. This is one of them, one of the lesser-known ones. This is the Curtis XF-15C. The XF-15C is one of at least three different designs made in the Navy's effort to bring jet fighters to carriers, the other two being the Ryan FR Fireball and the Ryan Dark Shark. The first of the bunch, the Fireball, was ordered by the Navy in 1943 and first flown in June 1944. While initial production of the Fireball was ongoing, the Navy was already looking into more powerful engines and better designs. The Fireball used a Wright R1820 piston engine with around 1,250 horsepower and a General Electric J31 jet engine with around 1,600 foot-pounds of thrust. The Curtis XF-15C design on paper promised to be much more powerful than the Fireball using a Pratt & Whitney R2800 piston engine with 2100 horsepower, and an Alice Chalmers J36 jet engine, a American-made licensed version of the British de Havilland Goblin, with 2700 foot-pounds of thrust. In promising to be better on paper than the Fireball before the Fireball was ever completed or flown, the Navy would then place an order with Curtis for three prototype XF-15Cs in April 1944. Curtis's design was both bigger than, and in one aspect, more compact than the Fireball, measuring in at 13.32 meters long and 15 meters wide, 
the initial design of the XF-15C differed from the Fireball in any significant sense in its sheer size, jet engine placement, and the tail section design. The XF-15C was about 3.5 meters longer and almost 4 meters wider than the Fireball. But at the same time, the jet engine placement on the XF-15C made it look a bit more stubby. Instead of having the jet engine's exhaust extend all the way to the tail of the aircraft, the XF-15C's jet engine was located just behind the wing, and the exhaust was around the midpoint of the cockpit and tail. Now, they probably could have done what the British and the Swedes later on did with this kind of engine and gave the plane a twin boom tail, but I guess they wanted to be different. The XF-15C was also outfitted with tricycle landing gear, just as the Fireball had, a tapered wing, and your standard-looking horizontal and vertical tail stabilizers. Where the XF-15C would have a chance to really differentiate itself from the Fireball, prove itself superior, was in the speed and armament. Owing to its much more powerful pair of engines, the XF-15C was around 60 miles an hour faster than the Fireball, 469 miles an hour compared to just 404 miles an hour. The listed armament for the XF-15C was also stronger, at least in a vacuum. Instead of the 450 caliber machine guns that the Fireball had, the XF-15C was outfitted with 420 mm cannons, with each gun having 200 rounds. I say this was more powerful in a vacuum because the Fireball had 300 rounds per gun, and like the XF-15C, the ability to carry eight 5-inch rockets and or two 1,000-pound bombs. For which airplane had the better guns, I guess it depends on whether you value bullet size or quantity. Eventually, in February 1945, the first XF-15C was completed, and it embarked on its first flight. Just like the Fireball, though, it was not outfitted with its jet engine initially, just the piston engine. While it would fly under the power of the propeller alone, the first real test would come when the jet was finally installed. In April, the jet engine would be installed, and in May, the XF-15C would fly under mixed propulsion for the first time. However, after just a few test flights, the first prototype would be lost. On May 8th, after a successful flight session, the prototype would crash land, possibly due to some issue with the engine and it not taking in fuel properly. The plane would be destroyed, and the test pilot, Charles Cox, would lose his life in the crash. Despite this major setback, testing on the XF-15C continued on July 9th, 1945, when the second prototype would take to the air. At this time, a minor but very noticeable modification would be made to both the second and third prototypes. While the first prototype did show promise with its speed, acceleration, and rate of climb, there was also noted issues with control and handling. In an effort to remedy this issue, the horizontal tail planes would be moved to the top of the vertical stabilizer, creating a T-tail design. From here, the two remaining prototypes would continue flight testing until October 1946 where the Navy would cancel all further development on the XF-15C and, in effect, end their search for a new mixed propulsion aircraft. Of the three designs mentioned in this video, the Fireball, in being the earliest of them, would have the most success, and even then it wasn't all that much. Just 71 of them were made, and they would only be in the Navy's arsenal from 1945 to 1947. The XF-15C was the second most successful, with the three prototypes made, and the Dark Shark was the least successful, numerically speaking, having just one prototype made. 
Dark Shark also lived on a little bit longer than the other two, as the Air Force had some interest in it, but it went nowhere with them, too. So, in the end, why did these three mixed propulsion designs amount to very little? If we boil it down, it comes down to these three things. World War II, performance, and the Navy's focus. For one, World War II, and more specifically, the Pacific War, ended August 1945. While the Fireball was organized into a squadron to be used in the Pacific, they never came into active combat. Once the war ended, though, military research and production priorities shifted. The military wouldn't desperately need to push out weapons, the enemies were defeated, so research and production could slow back down to peacetime levels. So this, at the very least, decelerated the project. Second, the performance of planes like the Fireball, the XF-15C, and the Dark Shark wasn't all that much better than late piston-engine aircraft. Compare the three to something like the P-51 Mustang. The top speed of the P-51D, for instance, was 437 miles an hour. The Fireball was slower at 404, the XF-15C was faster at 469, and the Dark Shark was the fastest at 497. The Dark Shark was also the latest of the three, so its greater speed does make sense. Still, considering the fact that the early jet engines they were using on these projects were pretty finicky, the speed boost offered by the XF-15C and the Dark Shark probably wasn't good enough. And lastly, the Navy and military elected to advance research and production into all jet aircraft. While it had only been a few years, it appears as though jet engine technology advanced enough to make a jet-powered carrier aircraft much more viable. The plane that would later become the Navy's first adopted jet fighter, the F-9F Panther, would first fly a year after the end of the mixed propulsion project, and would be cleared for carrier use two years after that, in 1949, just in time for America's next war in Korea. The F-9F was faster than all of the mixed propulsion fighters, at 579 miles an hour, and it could take off from a carrier. So, with those two things, that basically invalidated the reason for the XF-15C and Co. to exist. In the end, the XF-15C and its two companions is a relic of a very short transitional era. The blending of the peak of the previous era with the initial crudeness of the next era. Inevitably, a plane like the XF-15C would be doomed to have a short lifespan, regardless of whether or not it was officially adopted, like the Fireball was. It could only ever be a stopgap until jet engine technology improved, and because of how quickly jet engine technology advanced to sufficiently power a carrier-based jet, it never even got the chance to do that. Luckily, though, even though the XF-15C never got the chance to do anything, one of the prototypes does actually still exist. The other remaining prototype was scrapped, but the lone remaining XF-15C now resides at the Hickory Aviation Museum in North Carolina. Unfortunately, it is sat out in the elements and appears to be a little rough around the edges, Maybe they should get a big pop-up gazebo to put over it. Give it a little cover so it doesn't just rot away. But anyway, on that note, I think we'll go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. For whatever reason, whenever I see a plane with a T-tail design, I kind of imagine the plane hanging from it, like it got caught on some power lines and got stuck. I'm not sure why that's what I think of, but I do. Maybe because it looks more hook-like. I don't know. But anyway, though, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!